everyone. Jacob. Great, thank you. Yeah, so welcome everyone to this uh, second session in the Envision series this week. Thanks for joining us remotely. It's a bit of a different uh, different piece, but at least I take heart that our, our carbon emissions for this um, conference are significantly lower <laughs> in a, another time. So um, today our focus is, is kind of off the back. We have a project that's uh, started up over the last year um, in offshore direct air capture combined with wind energy and offshore um, carbon sequestration and basalt. Um, so this was really uh, motivating this session here. Uh, we've, we've called it putting the, the DAC, so putting the direct air capture in CCS, uh, CCS being carbon capture and storage, which you saw the recent uh, federal budget is, is definitely a hot topic and, and lots of um, look at this in, and there's a, a whole bunch of different facets here. So really the point of today is to give you a bit of an overview of kind of the terminology and, and the, uh, the space basically. Um, so this is a, on the front page here, that carbon engineering is their initial DAC plant up in Squamish. Um, and there's another shot there of uh, what we call BEX uh, that you'll learn more about um, over in Japan. So next slide, please, Harris. So um, today, so I'm gonna give a little bit of an introduction. We have a couple of activities for you as we go along here. So I'll introduce that. Um, then Devin's going to give you an overview of, of kind of the terminology and, and concepts involved in uh, nets in general, net being negative emission technologies, um, which obviously relate to carbon capture and storage. Uh, and then we'll have a bit of time for Q&A. So please uh, enter your questions as we go along in, in the chat there. I'll be uh, monitoring that and, and feeding them to our panelists. And then we frame this up as a uh, two world tours. So imagine you're gonna imagine yourself sitting in the year 2100, looking back at what may or may not have happened um, in the past in kind of, we're presenting it as two different worlds, probably reality is somewhere in the middle, but um, the first one will be Bex in a Prayer uh, with Heather and Gerard. And then the second one we've called Direct Drawdown uh, and Ryan, uh, Ryan Harris and Patrick are gonna present that for us. Once you've gone through that uh, virtual tour, um, then we're gonna have a wrap up piece. We're gonna uh, go and uh, do some reflection. I uh, get a chance to give us some feedback and voting on kind of what your sense is of this space and then some more time for Q and A at the end. Uh, next slide, please, Harris. So yeah, so our disclaimer, um, we are members of Solid Carbon, which as I mentioned, has a uh, direct air capture uh, piece to it. Um, but really, this isn't this is and the title may be suggested we're biased towards DAC. That's not with this presentation. We're trying to take an unbiased look across this whole space. So that's that's our intention here. I'm sure you'll tell us if we've uh, missed the mark. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, so, yes, as I mentioned, Q&A, we're going to use the chat function just to keep things um, uh, moving along. So please do that. I'm going to be monitoring that and, and collating them. As I said, there's a, there's a chance uh, in the middle and a chance at the end to take some of those questions. Uh, next slide, please. And this is where we want to get this uh, interactive with you. So uh, Harris is gonna post that second link for you in the chat. Um, you can go there and click on it. It'll take you to a web page. And essentially what we're doing is building a word cloud. Um, so you can enter as often and as much as you want over the whole duration of this uh, session. We're going to have a look at it at the, near the end of the session. And really what we're trying to, to do here is basically just ask you kind of what, what comes to mind? What are you thinking about when you hear CCS? Um, and it'll be interesting to see kind of how people think about that. And um, we're going to reflect on that at the end and see if maybe, maybe things change. So um, Harris, you were able to put that in the, in the chat for us, right? Yes, of course okay. I can do it right now. Okay. Um, so Harris does that. Uh, I will hand it over to Devin, who's going to take us through these uh, these pieces of the Nets puzzle. Okay. So I'm going to stop sharing. So Devin, you're able to screen share? Uh, yep. I'm just trying to press the button with my Perfect. mouse here. All right, I'm just gonna have to minimize everybody's picture so they're not blocking my notes. All right, can everybody see the uh, slides in dis display mode? Oh, am I good to go? Yeah, go for it. Okay, all right. 
All right, well, uh, thank you everybody. So I'm gonna give a quick whirlwind tour of the negative emissions space. And I pretty much have to start from the beginning uh, with a diagram of our world's carbon stocks and carbon fluxes. So the stocks are re or reservoirs. These are our oceans, atmosphere and terrestrial ecosystems. They're all interconnected and they're constantly exchanging carbon. So you have to understand when we talk about negative emissions or changing the carbon balance, any perturbation gets distributed over this entire system. Some of these exchanges are biogenic, so things like trees sucking down carbon. Some are abiotic, such as natural rock weathering or the ocean buffering CO2. Now, the, the climate problem is that we've taken a bunch of the CO2 from otherwise inaccessible, should, should take a bunch of the carbon from otherwise inaccessible fossil reservoirs and added it into this circulating system. All right, so what do we gotta do to deal with this? Well, um, you know, first thing we gotta reduce our positive emissions. Uh, as we reduce our gross positive emissions, we're going to encounter increasing pressure for negative emissions technologies. Uh, you might have heard of this idea before. The idea of negative emissions is to remove greenhouse gases from the atmosphere to bring overall emissions to zero or even negative. Another name for this is carbon dioxide removal. So this diagram here highlights where nets fit versus other actions. It's important to note that nets aren't positive emissions reductions, so it's not about efficiency. It's not about offsets from fuel, fuel switching. It's not about renewable energy, electrification, decarbonization, or other low carbon intensity stuff. Uh, nets are also not practices which manage solar radiation. Now, some of these things I just described uh, may need to happen to support nets, but in and of themselves, they aren't nets. I'm gonna talk a bit about what nets are in practice in just a bit, but first I wanna lay out more of the motivation. Essentially for a 1.5 degree Celsius uh, Paris compatible scenario, we're going to need a small but growing deployment of negative emissions capacity already in the near term. That means like today. We're also going to have a milestone where we hit negative emissions or net, sorry, I should say net negative emissions at about 2050 for CO2 or a few years later for CO2 equivalents. We're going to need ongoing negative emissions to compensate for historical emissions or delayed action. So if we just keep pumping out CO2, we're going to need to compensate for that. And we're gonna need ongoing negative emissions to compensate for residual positive emissions beyond 2050. So what are some of those sources of res residual positive emissions beyond 2050? Uh, it depends on our choices, but generally we consider these things hard to abate or hard to decarbonize sectors. The characteristics of these include diffuse emissions, so small emissions over a large spatial area, non-CO2 greenhouse gases, so nitrous oxides or methanes. We also have non-fossil sources of CO2, such as process emissions and more. Uh, these can come up in sectors like industrial sources, such as steel and cement manufacturing. They can come up in long range transportation by sea, land or air. And another uh, large sector where this can come up is in agriculture and in land use, land use change and forestry more broadly. So depending on the source, mitigating these away can be challenged by technical, economic or social hurdles. They must be uh, then compensated for by negative emissions. And in general, we can anticipate uh, a big need for negative emissions, but the question is how much? So how much negative emissions do we need? Uh, depends. It depends on how fast we can reduce emissions. So we're at about 10 years of current emissions before exceeding our 1.5 degrees Celsius budget. At that point, anything we put out has to come back in the ground. It also depends on how far we decarbonize. So how much of those residual emissions do we compensate for in perpetuity? What negative emissions technologies can do is provide a cost ceiling for decarbonization. And that's could be a good thing or a bad thing. How much negative emission tech, uh, do we need depends also on the potential uh, of hard to predict climactic feedbacks and consequences. So in the long run, negative emissions or solar radiation management may be required to address further warming, ocean acidification, and sea level rise, according to the IPCC. There's a wide range of anticipated negative emissions needs to stay on track for 1.5C. The National Academy of Science and Engineering Mathematics suggests uh, about 10 gigatons of CO2 equivalents globally per year by uh, mid-century, so 2050 and 20 gigatons of CO2 per year globally by 2100. Uh, here, here's the caveat. Uh, these, these numbers are just one top-down approach to quantifying the negative emissions need. And they're based on what's called integrated assessment modeling or IAMs. Uh, they're not forecasts, they're just possible futures based on what's modeled. And I'm gonna talk a bit about that now. <laughs> 
So it's important to understand what we're modeling. Firstly, I'm not a modeler. Uh, there are many models out there and please forgive any overgeneralizations. Uh, but in essence, what they do is they couple socioeconomic policy, emissions, technology, and climate information to help us ask different what if questions of our world. Outcomes can include quantities and compositions of negative emissions, so your negative, your net portfolio. Uh, it's, it's worth noting some of the caveats uh, around integrated assessment modeling. Models only do what is programmed in as is programmed in. They don't incorporate all the technology today, nor can they anticipate all the techno technological, social, or environmental shifts. They generally optimize for a lowest cost path, where if you put in an expensive option, there's going to be no, none of it. If you put in a cheap option for nets, it's going to dominate the entire portfolio. Models may also not capture reasonable biophysical limits, social and environmental harms and, bene and benefits, or other realities impacting kind of practical feasibility. So just a few other notes. Uh, there's lots of uncertainty around modeling. You know, it's not just one answer. And uncertainty can, can be challenging for modeling. Uh, but decision paralysis and the do-nothing strategy, you have to understand, it is definitely going to be more disastrous. Uh, integrated assessment modeling often invokes or suggests large scales of nets, uh, which can be maybe too much, depending on your perspective. And it may be best to actually ignore the uh, composition or the technology prescriptions suggested by integrated assessment models and, and instead think of the total as a proxy for a broader portfolio of nets, considering that we're not sure exactly what options are going to exist in the next few years. Now one can of worms I'm going to ignore for today, but I just want to raise is that in these models and much of climate discourse, we implicitly go along with the concept of climate budgets and temperature targets. We don't necessarily recognize the built in moral hazard and consequence for intergenerational equity. And we also don't necessarily recognize how this framing can be weaponized to delay action. Okay, so that's the motivation. Now I'm going to talk about, you know, what is a negative emission. So nets are CO2 removals. And again, that's distinct from emissions reductions. We're going to need both for our, you know, fixing our climate, but we need to make sure when we're talking about negative emissions that they're actually real reductions. Uh, nets can look very different from each other, but they share common outcomes. When considering if something is or isn't a net, it helps to keep some questions in mind. So the first one is, where is the carbon from? If you're getting carbon from fossils, this is not a net. Uh, where does the carbon go? If it's going in the ground, okay. If it's going back in the air, that's not going to be a net. If it goes into the oceans, that, that depends. Is where the carbon goes permanent? Uh, the carbon has to be locked away robustly in vegetation, soils, rocks, geological reservoirs, or other long-lived products. If you're making fuels or carbonated beverages, these will not qualify as nets. Another important uh, note is, was the act intentional and additive? So is there a climate benefit relative to the no intervention scenario? Do all the releases and drawdowns add up at face value in an LCA? Um, are there leakages in our accounting? Are we ignoring the forest plot next door that gets chopped instead of the one we're trying to get credits for? The simple answer to these questions is, is that negative emissions uh, extract CO2 from the atmosphere and lock it away for centuries, which seems easy enough, but there can be fringe cases without clear answers. I'm going to talk about some of the factors that lead into that now. So where things can get complicated is, for example, in the LCA accounting and the definition of the baseline or the counterfactual scenario for additionality. This can introduce user judgment on methodology. And the best answers to these questions are likely to actually evolve over time within the project or facility lifetimes as we deeply decarbonize our society. So our baseline is shifting. What happens, another complication is what happens when removals get mixed up with avoided emissions and, and or credits in an overall scheme and whether they should be. What about using feedstocks, which are byproducts from some greenhouse gas emitting products? Also, what about the life cycle of products from our negative emissions processes? Are they going to be introducing uh, carbon? So one, one concrete example of, of how things get complicated is an enhanced oil recovery. So enhanced oil recovery presently uses massive quantities of mined CO2, CO2 taken out of the ground from in gaseous state, and we use that to make oil from wells. Now, instead, we could use direct air capture. So we take CO2 from the air and use that CO2 instead of mining it. That saves us the mined CO2 being added to the atmosphere, but we're still producing oil. Now, the CO2 costs money, and firms are nominally incentivized to minimize how much CO2 that's getting trapped in the reservoir. 
uh, there are net negative oil claims out there, but you have to be aware that they might only be talking about the production emissions and not the carbon embodied within the actual oil product. So you have to really understand the specifics around the project, the reservoir and the reservoir's operation strategy. Uh, otherwise, oh yeah, sorry, that's it. People are joining. Um, so I'm not laying judgment on, on good or bad tech when it comes to EOR but you have to understand that the negativeness can be a question mark. Um, in contrast to EOR, we also have plenty of alternative geo sequestration capacity, including depleted hydrocarbon reservoirs uh, that, that don't involve stimulating new production. All right, here's another uh, big kind of um, uh, conflict point. Uh, Nature-based solutions and, and engineered solutions. You might, you might have heard of this. Uh, it's not a very useful distinction. Uh, or, or it's only really useful for, say, uh, for actors pushing agendas based on, on public uh, naive, naivety. There's, it's important to note, there's, there's nothing intrinsically good or natural in leveraging organisms or ecosystems for negative emissions goals. Managing ecosystems for carbon does not guarantee conservation, ecosystem services, or preserved social or cultural uh, values or benefits. It's, it's really essential to understand the specifics of a practice or a technology and how it fits within a milieu. Uh, it is possible to get more granular and that can be useful. So for example, identifying biotic or photosynthetic carbon capture or carbon retention in organic materials. I'm gonna talk about that in the next slide. Uh, what that can do is that can permit general observations about the extent and character of storage permanence, reservoir capacity, space requirements and more. However, uh, specific cases can defy group expectations. Now, Overall, we need to do better in managing our lands and waters. Um, carbon removals just might be a co-benefit, not the priority. And just to preempt any possible question on this, uh, no, a nature-based solution only portfolio, excluding BECs, uh, will not work anymore for 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, Paris targets. Uh, yeah, at least not anymore. That, that ship has sailed, in all likelihood. All right. So here's a cartoon which uh, kind of captures the negative emissions technology space and some of the building blocks that go into it. It's not exhaustive uh, and you might recognize some of these building blocks from the point source carbon capture space. Now to set the stage for our next speakers, one group's going to be talking about biomass energy with carbon capture and storage. So this is a form of energy production where we use cropped biomass to create electricity usually. We could also be making hydrogen heat or liquid fuel. And we capture a portion of the organic carbon, typically a CO2 from this process, and then we put it towards geologic storage or into long-lived products. Our other group's gonna be talking about direct air capture. This is a mechanized process that removes CO2 from ambient air, and then again, allows that concentrated CO2 to be sent to geological storage or put into long-lived products. I'm gonna quickly go over the other few options that are, that are depicted here in, in the cartoon. Other net options include accelerated weathering, so we can use reactive minerals to draw down CO2 from the air. We can do ocean alkalinization, so we add reactive minerals to the ocean that then draw down CO2 from the air. We can look at soil carbon sequestration, so land management practices to increase the storage of carbon in soils. Typically, that's in the context of agricultural lands, but can also apply to grasslands. We have coastal blue carbon, so that's a, that's a mixed bag of land management practices for coastal areas like mangroves, tidal marshes, and seagrass meadows. Improved forest management is another one where we're again managing existing forests to enhance the removals. That's gonna be into the soils as well as into the woody biomass. And then in the other big category is afforestation and reforestation. So here we're creating forests, uh, new forests where they didn't exist before. I'd also like to recap just a few of the storage mechanisms that are in play here. So carbon can be accumulated in ecosystems. Those are the accessible carbon stocks. If you, if you uh, think back to the first diagram I showed of the different um, reservoirs, you know, we can store more carbon in that terrestrial ecosystem, for example. Biomass can also be stored in bio-derived products. So making biochar, for example, which can offer more durable storage than leaving it and say as, as living woody biomass. CO2 can also be stored superficially on lands and oceans via mineralization. So we take all these uh, reactive minerals, crush it up, spread it over farm fields and, and let it sit. CO2 can also be injected into geological structures deep underground, which is definitely essentially permanent. All right, oh, sorry. 
Oh, okay. One too many. Sorry, there's a there's a lag here. All right, sorry, my mouse, my mouse backed up. All right, so into which of these uh, negative emissions technologies should I be investing my my time, money, and policy? It's a very popular question, and I don't have an answer. The challenge is that negative emissions defy reduction. There's a real symmetry and heterogeneity in the costs, harms, and benefits, and a lot of uncertainty. Any of the indicators that you see on this diagram is really multidimensional. So for example, if we were to think about just costs and revenues uh, timelines, uh, something like a direct air capture mechanized facility is gonna have a different uh, profile than something like a forest management program. Now you could try and incorporate all our best guesses and, and build up a top-down portfolio, including major considerations like capacity, permanence, technological readiness level, land, water materials, dollars, and more. And to some extent, this is what the integrated assessment modeling does. Uh, you can also roll in uh, sustainable development goals as a metric. But I want to bring some caution around uh, oversimplified top-down perspectives. It can be really dangerous to apply overly rigid statements or rank orders to negative emissions technologies. What it can do is it can risk disenfranchising stakeholders by bringing in a superficially technocratic process with baked-in norms. I mentioned the intergenerational equity before. It risks neglecting critical technical uh, environmental and social justice considerations on the ground where things are actually going to get deployed. And it may not reflect how many actors actually need to get together to make a successful project happen. All right. Sorry. All right, there we go. So, you know, who's, who's winners is, is the question, you know, and that's really going to depend on who's making the choice. The actors and considerations here are, are only illustrative. I, I kind of made up these, these imaginary people, but I just want to draw out an example. And I mentioned the life cycle implications of enhanced oil recovery earlier. Now, regardless of how negative EOR might be, how do you think the public's going to perceive the production of oil in tandem with a negative emission? How might the public perceive other negative emission technology elements? For example, there's a long relationship with the oil and gas sector and point source carbon capture, which is a building block for say BEX. Now negative emissions technologies are new and we don't really know yet how people will uh, perceive kind of the whole versus the individual components of the system. But I'll just have a couple of recommendations, uh, which is to recognize the importance of project level considerations and to really understand the motivations and the incentives uh, that might be driving solution proponents and detractors. Why I'm kind of trying to uh, step back and take this really broad view is essentially, I, I don't want to see negative emissions get captured by the same pathology driving today's fossil energy sector. All right, that's the next slide once that clicks over. Oops. Too many. All right. so. Negative emissions are, are not without the challenges. Uh, our next speakers will, will talk more about this, but I just want to hit a few big ones. Core is that negative emissions are, for the most part, a cost sink, at least at scale. There are niche markets, but they have limited capacity, um, market and technical capacity. There is also a huge inertia for business as usual. For example, the existing stocks of bought and paid for emitting infrastructure uh, will overwhelm our net capacity if we don't do something about, about that. Uh, we also have the issue that tackling greenhouse gases and negative emissions is a public good with global distribution, but we don't necessarily have the uh, right incentives and disincentives to make that happen. We don't really know who and how is going to be paying for this. There is some progress. Yeah, my mouse is double clicking. That's what's happening. So there is some progress in this, uh, but not really. So for all the publicity, there is little at scale progress on nets. It's early days. There is progress in some of the building blocks. So for example, this diagram shows the evolution of the point source carbon capture space. Already there are several uh, million ton per year facilities. And some of the ethanol facilities that you see here would constitute BECs. Um, although I can't tell you for sure if they're net negative because negative emissions wasn't necessarily the, the design priority there. Now, here's the thing. We need significantly more growth than this uh, over all our net, net options. And to get to gigaton scales of CO2 removals in the near future, we're going to need urgent investment towards research and development, as well as de uh, development of projects now, <laughs> soon. All right. But uh, so where does Canada sit in, in, the, in this whole picture? Uh, well, we have a record of failing on climate. 
uh, looking ahead, we have a pledge for net zero by 2050. We have no strategy to, on how to get there. Uh, just last Friday, we had a pledge for 40 to 45% reductions by 2030. This is still inadequate uh, for Paris goals. We're also a major fossil producer and exporter. Uh, we are anticipating that production is going to continue to rise, uh, but, but who's going to be buying that stuff in a decarbonized world? And uh, the other question is, are we banking, uh, for example, on fossils and CCS? Or are we banking on uh, hydrogen, which might be surreptitiously derived from fossils and CCS? That would, uh, these options do nothing for removals. Now, the thing is, uh, we could be a net leader. Uh, we have the renewables, the land, and the geology. But we also risk wasting in the near term our easy net options on delayed action. And we also have a current federal focus and provincial focus in BC on trees and agriculture. That's not necessarily robust in a, clean, in a changing climate. And these accumulations may not be uh, additional to the baselines. It, 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 these are tricky sectors for that. All right, so just quick takeaways. I'm a bit over time. Uh, I had a lot of questions <laughs> had to pose to, the, to our, our audience. I don't have great answers, uh, but I will provide a few takeaways. First is the need. Uh, negative emissions are not a substitute for emissions reductions, but they are essential to any net zero emissions future. Uh, and we, we need to scale this soon. There are many options for negative emissions, uh, but they each have unique considerations for the technology and the projects, and there's no one size fits all. Right now, though, we're on a backwards footing, so our action has been insufficient. And in doing so, we're setting up an even more desperate for ne net need for nets in the future. And we don't necessarily have the right tools in place to support that anyways. Um, what I hope to do is that we uh, start seeing an opportunity where BC and Canada could be taking a leadership position. We pursue learning by doing, uh, but to do that, we're gonna need some ambitious policy behind that. Okay, and really quickly, just to recap some of the key terms to prepare for our next speakers. Negative emissions technologies, uh, nets or CDR, we take CO2 out of the air, we lock it away. Carbon capture and sequestration or carbon capture and utilization and sequestration. So we just add the U in there. So we're taking CO2 from usually a point source, but it could be from the air and uh, we use it or we lock it away where it won't go, where it won't get out. Uh, direct air capture, that takes CO2 from the air with machines. Usually we combine that with some sort of utilization or sequestration. And lastly, we have bioenergy and uh, carbon capture or BECs. So plants take CO2 from the air we harvest those plants, get some energy out of it, and we lock some of that carbon away. All right, and that concludes things. So I will. Okay. Thanks, Devin. Yeah, sorry, pretty quick. Um, That's good. Um, so we got a, a cap it at five minutes for now. We got questioned uh, later on as well. So some of the ones coming in on the chat there. Um, so uh, one of the ones that was around blue carbon and contrasting that to blue hydrogen. If you, Blue. Uh, so, um, is it is it referring to uh, coastal blue carbon or just blue carbon? It just said, "What is blue carbon?" I'm, I was less. I, was, oh. you know. um, I, I guess so. So when I hear those words, I, I normally think of of the class of technologies called coastal blue carbon, and so these are uh, practices which use the uh, coastal or nearshore ecosystems to to draw down CO two. And so that would be things like, can we manage our uh, tidal marshes uh, to accumulate more carbon in the sediments? Um, and, yeah. and so that's all fine and good. And, and currently that's, that is a priority being explored by National Academies of Sciences. The, the challenge with this sector is that is, is a question of additionality. So I mentioned that word several times, but a, a practical example is, of this is if we do nothing, the sea levels may or may not rise at a rate that causes net uh, emissions from these environments. Uh, if we make some sort of intervention, are we, are we really getting removals or are we just avoiding those gross positive emissions and you know, into which bin of progress might that go? That, that's for example, in those in tidal controlled areas. Sure. Okay. Yeah. And a twig, another one maybe to clarify for people, yeah. as we take uh, carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, what's happening in the ocean? Good, good question. So uh, the first slide, uh, I, te technically I won't share it, but um, the surface ocean, so say the first so many meters, um, and the atmosphere are in constant flux, uh, exchanging CO2. So if you were to remove uh, CO2 from the air, 
um, you wouldn't see a one for one reduction in the air's PPM CO2. The ocean actually buffers this. And so you'll take some CO2 out of the air. You'll have some total reduction from the air, but not the same amount because the ocean will actually off gas some CO2. So there's always this exchange happening. Yeah. And then the relationship to ocean acidification is another yeah. challenge. Yeah. yeah. Another question here, I don't know if you actually run the numbers on this, but uh, this is asking about EOR, is it actually net negative? And I guess not so much even the pushing it into the ground part, but if you're gonna burn what you got out, um, so the accounting on that. Um, yeah, it, 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 so it, it, yeah, I can't speak in general terms, um, you know, for the entire class of technologies. Uh, the, the important, one, one of the key parameters, I think, when it comes to the operations is, is the CO2 efficiency. So how much CO2 you are spending to produce so much oil from a particular reservoir. And that's really an operational choice. Um, programs like 45Q in the United States that gives a tax, a tax incentive to, you know, we'll pay you some money if you just operate to have a little more CO2 stay in the reservoir could change how operators operate in order to have more more CO2 stick around. But, uh, you know, at face value, it doesn't smell good uh, to me, <laughs> especially if you if you if you start to consider, you know, what is the um, the uh, once you start considering the embodied carbon in the oil, uh, you really have to look at the claims by organizations. Typically, they'll say, well, we're selling it to somebody, they're burning it. The emissions associated with burning it is on the user, not on us. We wash our hands of this. And so, yeah, I, EOR doesn't really smell good to me. Yeah, yeah, it's the accounting again, yeah. That leads into the next question. Where, where does the revenue come? So you, you alluded to Q45, it's probably worth just mentioning to people what, where can you go and sell these kind of services? Yeah, um, so we have uh, a growing, I guess, nascent ecosystem of of, of markets for removals. So we already have, you know, uh, mitigation markets are, are a thing. People who are focusing on remo removals is, is a new thing. It's, it's limited capacity and you really have to question whether the vol th these are all voluntary. These voluntary removal markets really have enough scale to, to help us and the answer is no, probably not, certainly not right now. So ultimately um, ignoring some really niche applications where there is a, uh, you know, a revenue that you can extract. So carbon, carbon cure, Halifax company putting CO2 into concrete, they actually make a buck off this and, and it makes sense. But um, otherwise just, you know, do geological sequestration. That's a pure cost thing. No one, no one gets a value out of CO2 going in the ground and the money ultimately has to come from some sort of policy framework uh, set by governments. Yeah. yeah. That led into another related question or asking if there's a, a geothermal tie-in here that helped that would maybe Yeah, change the no, that's that's great. Yeah, I'm glad that came up. So so that goes back to my statement about, you know, project level specifics. And geothermal is a very kind of site specific thing. And so there are definitely synergies available where some of our direct air capture solutions, the, the mechanized ones, uh, can utilize uh, waste, or it's not really waste, but you know, low grade heat that geothermal is well suited to provide. And uh, you'd think, hey, we should put our DAC systems, you know, where geothermal, where geothermal sites are located. Yeah. Uh, and, and the economics, you know, there would be different than if we were to say, put it in the middle of nowhere where there are no ge geothermal, maybe you'd put a different net option there. And so, yeah, it's great that that question came up. Good. Um, Got lots of other ideas here. Uh, maybe one more just with the recent federal budget. There's a big <laughs> couple hundred million bucks in there for CCS. What what the feds actually mean by that when they're and, and how it fits in their strategy? We mentioned around point source, soil sands, et cetera, versus VAC and um without having read in detail the budget, the CCS um funding that they've described seems geared mostly towards the point source capture space and that could be going towards cleaning up say refinery emissions or the emissions coming out of um, hydrogen production so taking natural gas making hydrogen capturing co2 from that we might then use the hydrogen in, in refinery processes and other petrochemical uh things um it doesn't strike me as a solution that yeah i should say uh it, it's not Really, that money is something that's going to be helping. I think the early stage of negative emissions. 
And the reason for that is at least the one mechanism was based on a capital tax or a capital investment tax credit. And so that's only going to help projects that um, are using off the shelf commercial technology, like adding CCS to your hydrogen plant. It does nothing to really support early stage technical development on carbon capture, say DAC, um, direct air capture. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, so yeah, I want to make sure we keep uh, moving along. So we're going to, uh, I'll just remind people of that um, Mentimeter um, page. Eris, if you could just throw that in the, uh, the chat again. And then we're going to move on to our world tour number one. Um, if we'll queue up those slides as well. And again, the intent of these world tours is Imagine you, you're your grandchild sitting in 2100 and, and getting a lecture on what, what's happened. I mean, great grandchild, depending on where you're at. Um, so over, over to Gerard and Heather. Thanks, Corinne. Good morning, everyone. My name is Gerard. And here with my colleague, Heather, we will explore together a world which um, aiming to keep global average temperature below 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2100, um, put their hopes on bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, also known as PETS. Here, we will give a peek at what the state of the world looks like when deployment of PECs is prioritized and maximized in a way that is compliant with staying below 1.5 degrees Celsius. We will explore the effects that such a scenario has on resources and economics too, and see whether this is compatible with other major society aims, such as the um, sustainable development goals. Next, please. Um, but before doing that, let's clarify what PEGS is. PEGS is a group of technologies that span many sectors. The process starts with CO2 being absorbed from the atmosphere via photosynthesis into the biomass of plant materials. Um, the biomass may then be burned to generate electricity or heat in power plants used in industrial facilities such as paper mills or converted into fuels in biorefineries. That's important for the technology to be carbon negative. The CO2 contained within the biomass and released during combustion or conversion must be captured and stored indefinitely. For that, the sequestered carbon may need to be transported in pipelines or trucks, depending on the location of the plant before finally being injected uh, in deep geologic formations. Next. Now, you may wonder why back in 2021, we chose X as our main negative emissions technology in the first place. Next. Why not only afforestation and reforestation, which looks more friendly, familiar, uh, even easier and straightforward. Next. Or even capturing CO2 directly from the atmosphere, which looks less intensive in terms of land and water requirements. Next. Well, in comparison, for example, to only afforestation and reforestation, back in 2021, next showed a higher permanence of CO2, which means that once it's stored, the time before the, the CO2 goes back to the atmosphere is much higher. And also in addition, back in 2021, DEX was one of the most market competitive negative emission technologies with a cost of 100 to $200 per ton of CO2 captured, as you can see in the bar chart. Although the technology readiness level of PEX depends on the specific application, back in 2021, there were commercial DEX plants that had been operating for decades 
such as those producing bioethanol that David mentioned. So uh, we decided to move forward with it. Next. So in our scenario in which BEX is prioritized and deployed at large scale between 2021 and 2100, what has really been the contribution of BEX to reducing the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere? Uh, further, what are other external conditions? Uh, so which other external conditions must be given? Um, firstly, note that the global CO2 annual emissions decreased from its maximum of 40 gigatons in 2020, the red arrow, to less than 10 gigatons in only around 30 years, the blue arrow, mainly as a result of reductions in the buildings, electricity, and industry sectors. Without this rapid reduction of emissions, the limited capacity for PEX to absorb CO2 would not have led to negative emissions. Then, thanks to the deployment of PEX starting in the early 2020s, with a few gigatons of CO2 capture per year, the remaining emissions, mostly from transportation, were balanced out by mid-2030s, as you can see, pushing Dex capacity even more to over 12 gigatons of CO2 capture a year provides a negative emission balance with more CO2 effectively being removed from the atmosphere than entering it, the green arrow. All right, but how did we provide the conditions for Bex to capture over 12 gigatons of CO2 per year? Next. In other words, which were the required innovations in um, economics, policy, and technology to implement large-scale deployment of BEX? And which were the impacts they had on, for example, the environment? Next. The first challenge was a matter of innovation and how to drive BEX to commercial readiness knowing that taking innovations to commercial maturity tends to be risky and uncertain, both when it comes to technological performance and also financing. Secondly, given that the economies of a scale in the transportation and storage part of the CO2 supply chain were substantial, it wasn't feasible that each and every CO2 capture project developed had its own storage supply chain. Instead, a large infrastructure of transportation and storage was developed to gather CO2 from different sources. Finally, there are several types of feedstocks which can be used, such as agricultural residues or um, organic waste, for instance. Given that the type of feedstock determines the water and land requirements, it's important to ensure a sustainable production of biomass, as well as to avoid abusive environmental stresses on countries with lower, uh, with lower regulations. This was done through adoption of global sustainability and fair biomass standards. Next. An example of this potential for localized and uneven environmental stresses is represented in this map. Almost 84% of BEX deployment occurs in developing nations with 26% with alone in Africa. Although the reason behind this split has to do with land availability and productivity, it is important to note that the reduction of land required for tax deployment may carry with it an increase in food prices, as Heather will explain later. This means that large scale deployment of PEX must be regulated so that existing problems to put access, such as those in developing regions, are not exacerbated. Next. What about the economic and regulatory challenges? Which changes were necessary in those respects? Sorry. Um, first, BEX is a very capital intensive technology, which forced public agencies to step in during its early stages of development 
and assume part of the risks uh, private firms weren't willing to assume. However, all this scaled up achieved thanks to external financing would have had little value without the market demand for carbon dioxide removal, basically without the business model to run. The answer to that came with two policy mechanisms. Um, the first one, a tradable certificate program. Uh, their index plan, index plans uh, were granted cert uh, certificates for capturing um, CO2, while some companies were mandated to purchase a certain volume of certificates, this way creating a demand for CO2 removal. In the second one, a reverse auction program, governments committed to procure a certain volume of negative emissions over a period of time, while DEX plants submitted bids with prices at which they could accomplish this. That strengthened the competition between different DEX companies, which lowered CO2 capture value over time as well. However, how was the industry kickstarted? How was the potential of DEX initially unlocked? In the beginning, most bioenergy with carbon capture applications were destined to conversion purposes. That drove innovation, innovation in the industry and enabled first cost reductions while risking some of its fundamental technologies and processes. Next. The policies that were implemented were incredibly uh, effective and the energy system underwent a rapid transition by 2050, coal was no longer utilized without carbon capture and storage, and BEX was nearly 38% of energy consumption. By 2100, renewables were the single greatest source of energy, um, and nuclear had scaled up by many orders of magnitude as well. Um, because of the negative emission capacity of bioenergy and capture and storage, it wasn't necessary to transition the entire energy system. and so some amount of oil and natural gas were left, um, still emitting, but compensated by BEX, and they allowed um, difficult to, to, um, to deal with emissions, for example, from airplanes to, to remain within the system. Next. So the world we live in right now is, is in many ways lucky. We have clean energy that's relatively plentiful and relatively inexpensive, and it, it comes from BEX, nuclear, point source capture and storage, and, and a large focus on renewables. Um, over time, this meant there were some adjustments to be made. For example, not everybody was happy with nuclear in the first instance, and, and sort of questions around nuclear waste needed to be resolved. But the, the world we, in, we live in now has solved many of these problems, and we can move forward. Next. The reason why BEX is credited with a lot of the prosperity that's in our society is because it effectively capped the carbon price at $240 per ton. So by avoiding the need to mitigate some of the very expensive emissions, the carbon price did not increase enough to seriously impact economic consumption. So the world we live in right now, the sort of global economies and general assumption of, of goods across our world is really similar to what it was in 2020. Next. So this has enabled the quality of life to be maintained for most people. In addition, because the areas where large amounts of BEX have been deployed, like um, Africa and Asia, they're coming from agriculture. So there's been a relatively wide distribution of employment that has helped to raise some people out of poverty. Next. Of course, it might seem like for now that we sort of got to have our cake and eat it too, in the sense that we still live in a prosperous society and have been able to avoid climate impacts. There were prices to be paid. One of those prices was in land use. We committed as a society to protect and enhance our forests. We also committed not to use areas of natural protection and the like to enable BEX, which meant that some of the land that was used ultimately had to come from pasture and food crops. Um, by 2100, BEX is using about 25% of our arable land. Next. This did have consequences for the prices of some products. Um, for example, livestock is now about three times as expensive. There was much debate leading up during this transition about exactly what the impact would be. The truth came out somewhere in the middle. 
there are certain products like livestock, so a steak might cost you $100 now, that have seen significant impacts, similar to bread, which might cost you $7 now. Um, and the concern around here is that there were some areas like Africa where food prices went up, not massively, but the people that were not benefiting from employment in the area did then face higher food prices. And so there are questions of equity and policy that are sort of um, a, a, a matter that is still being managed today. Next. In addition, the, the water from, for the BECs um, took about 15% of, of, of water use. Next. Which had consequences, the number of people facing water stress, which is defined as being in an area where the amount of water you get is roughly equal to the amount you consume, doubled. Um, this was particularly a, a matter in places like Africa and India. Next. In some areas, they were able to invest technologically, so with desalination technology, which has spread across the globe now. Next. But not everybody was able to make those investments. And so water aid is, is now a, a sort of a, a more um, significant feature of aid in our world. And water quotas are also a more significant feature than they were before. Next. And lastly, the fertilizer requirements um, for BEX were, were also substantial. About 30% of, of 2010 um, fertilizer use now goes to BEX in our world. Next. This created a number of um, externalities that were needing to be worked out. So particularly the, the nitrogen that's now in the ground had the capacity to leak into uh, water, um, which so in some cases it exceeded the allowable limit for nitrates and such in the water and um, caused problems. In addition, nitrogen that made it out to the ocean. Um, in some cases, the, both the nitrogen and potassium out in the ocean caused algae blooms, and in some cases, those were so significant that they deoxygenated the water and caused fish to die. Um, over time, a number of these issues, not just fertilizer, but also water and land use, were able to be adapted over time. So as we move from first generation crops to second generation and third generation, so things out of corn and ethanol towards algae and wood and other products that had, and we we're able to sort of regionalize where we were putting the different crops to sort of learn and grow. Um, many of these issues were able to be resolved, but they happened over, it, ha it had to happen over time and lessons were learned. Like there were some major, major events of, of fish dying and the like that happened during the time as we were learning to work this out. Next. So in summary, the world we live in now is, is prosperous, prosperous, it has clean energy, and most important, it was able to stay below 1.5 degrees. And so we never did face some of the cataclysmic uh, climate impacts that were a concern um, many years ago. Um, what enabled this to happen was firstly Bex technology, um, but also the rapid policy implementation that allowed only a small overshoot during the transition period, which meant that Bex was able to by itself compensate for the negative emissions that were needed. The price of this transition was um, that we pushed our ecosystem, our land and our water um, and our nitrogen cycles really to the absolute capacity that they can sustain. And so these are now areas that have to be very actively mon ma monitored and managed and, and will continue to be actively managed going forward. And, and as with any transition, some people were left behind and there were winners and losers. Thank you. Great, thanks Heather. So that's our, our version one hypothetical world um, we'll move on to world two. And again, if you've got questions, throw them in the, uh, in the question box, the chat box, and we'll, uh, we'll get to those in a bit. All right, take it away. All right, so direct drop down. Uh, so as uh, we are looking, uh, if we look back to, uh, to 2020s or 2021, uh, the CO2 was a big giant and a big trouble uh, globally uh, because it was causing uh, the temperature rise of around 1.5 to 2 degrees Celsius. Uh, and uh, the CO2 issues and the global warming issues and how we controlled and which technology played a significant role uh, in that uh, we are going to discuss in this presentation. So the technology is known as direct air capture or DEC. Uh, 
so uh, uh, a couple of uh, specifications and how this technology works is that it captures the co2 directly from the atmospheric air because in the atmospheric air the co2 uh, is basically in the lower low concentration and it also provides the net negative emissions uh, provided because it captured the CO2 from the atmosphere instead of only capturing the CO2 from the flue gases or uh, the industrial synthesis gases, it captured the CO2 from the atmospheric air. Yes, of course, it is an energy intensive process. Uh, why? Because uh, as I already mentioned that it uh, this technology captured the CO2 from the atmospheric air where the co2 concentration is quite low and uh, i will also uh, dwell on this a bit in my coming slide in the next slide that why it takes the more energy to capture the C uh, co2 from the uh, low concentration airstream and uh, the main technologies that uh, uh, we had for the co2 uh, for the direct air capture or the using the chemicals like liquid solvents or the solid solvents so this main uh, this technology mainly depends upon the uh, uh, capturing uh, or yeah the capturing and the depressurizing of the co2 so in the first step it captures uh, any liquid solvent or solid solvent whichever we have in the technology it captures the co2 uh, from the atmospheric air and then in the next step uh, there are different techniques that are used. Sometimes we provide the steam uh, to deep pressurize and uh, desorb the CO2. And sometimes it's uh, we provide very high temperature. For example, if we are using solid sol uh, liquid solvents, we have to provide a high temperature of around 800 degrees Celsius to desorb the CO2 and then later on use it for different purposes like sequestration and the synthetic fuel synthesis. And another process uh, technique is that is available is based on the pressure that is uh, really the CO2 is released from the uh, from the liquid solvent or the solid solvent. Okay, so in here we can see the reason why this is a very energy intensive process uh, because uh, this captures the CO2 from the atmospheric air and in air the CO2 concentration is very low in very and the ppm uh, parts per million is around 380 to 580 so in here we can clearly see that uh, the minimum work required to capture the co2 uh, will keep on increasing with the drop in the concentration or the work will keep on decreasing with the rise in concentration or the mole fraction so in the atmospheric we have the co2 in very low ppm so that's why it requires it requires a lot of work to capture the co2 and that's what made this process a very energy intensive one okay so in here you can uh, as i already mentioned that this is an energy intensive process so on the right uh, graph we can see the energy consumptions required uh, using different technologies of uh, liquid solvents or solid solvents, including and excluding storage. And these energy requirements uh, or energy consumptions, they decreased, uh, they, uh, decreased significantly with time because uh, of the maturity in the liquid solvents and solid solvents. Because as I already described that uh, some of the uh, liquid solvents, they require almost like 800 degrees Celsius uh, to release the CO2. Uh, then uh, we, can, we can use it for different purposes like sequestration or synthetic fuel synthesis. But with the time, uh, some uh, liquid solvents and solid solvents came uh, where we did not require that much of energy consumption and not that much of high temperature that could release the CO2 at lower temperature of around 80 or 100 degrees Celsius. And in here, uh, another uh, significant uh, advantage that is accompanied uh, that uh, with this uh, direct air capture method that helped us a lot to build a sustainable uh, community and sustainable environment that we have today was the re uh, was the possible integration with the renewable energy not only on the offshore uh, onshore but the offshore as well because uh, this also shows the flexibility of. Uh, this direct air capture unit, which also helps us uh, helped us to establish uh, uh, what we had uh, 
have today. So uh, this is not a land dependent process, not only the productive or the non-productive land. This can also be employed on the offshore facilities, which uh, we can see that uh, many of the projects we have uh, already existing and we had in the past as well. So it can be the uh, it, renewable energy integrated or uh, either on the offshore and offshore and the CO2 that is captured using this direct air capture technology can be used for multiple purposes like the synthetic fuel synthesis or uh, it can be uh, injected into the deep sea known in the basalt rocks or for the geological storage as well and now i would like to uh, to invite my colleague to continue from here so I Thanks, Harris. Um, yeah, so as, as we mentioned before, we're going to start discussing kind of what this world actually looks like in 2100. So um, based on kind of a, a high DAC of, of acceptance of, you know, 10 gigatons a year kind of thing. Next slide. Um, so what, what do these DAC facilities look like in practice? Well, we can see these large scale concentrated facilities or these kind of modular distributed facilities that we see on the right. Um, we implement these, or we have implemented these in different locations based on what we have around. Um, and so, you know, if we have large areas of land with, um, that's not going to be usable for other things like that, we could place one of these large industrial facilities, whereas if we had um, higher competition for land, we could place these modular units um, using excess re renewable electricity and things like that. Next slide. So we can reflect back on how we use our land over the last hundred years or so. Um, as we chose to implement DAC over other technologies, two important considerations came into play. It's both the quantity of the land and the quality of the land. As we can see, implementing the scale that we arrived at, around 10 gigatons, um, we had to cover roughly the size of Ireland just in direct air capture units. Um, that's not accounting for the actual energy generation, but we'll discuss that in a little bit here. Um, then that brings us to the quality of the land. Because DAC is so flexible in where it can be placed, it can um, avoid competition with arable land, um, which can save crops and wildlife. So next slide. Um, so what can we? So what did we achieve by choosing these locations strategically? Um, although we did see extinction of species, still we can see that um, this was minimized due to the fact that we weren't. Um, partaking in ecological destruction due to the fact that we can place these anywhere. Um, we'll also see lower impacts on our food resources um, due to, again, that, that competition with that land. Next slide. Um, as we kind of discussed here, DAC has the, the ability to be independent of its, uh, of its location. So it can be located near its injection site, renewable energy, or its capture agent. Um, so this has allowed us to explore areas such as these offshore locations shown on the left here. These are areas that have high wind resources, uh, basalt rock for storage, and reasonable water depth. So that allowed us to place these units on offshore facilities using, you know, old oil and gas infrastructure, things like that, to actually avoid um, land competition. Um, let's go to the next slide. That kind of runs us into some of the transport implications. So we can see that with any of these carbon mitigation strategies, we're really going to have large CO2 pipelines. Um, but what we've allowed ourselves here using primarily DAC is to be transporting the CO2 smaller distances, um, as well as not having to transport that primary capture agent because ultimately we, um, because air is abundant everywhere and it's not dependent on where, where our capture agent is itself. Um, run on to the, uh, the next slide. So one of the major downfalls that we've seen from implementing this much DAC, um, if we look at how much additional energy we required, that's one of the, the biggest um, costs to doing this. As we can see, we require roughly two and a half million megawatts of additional capacity on top of what we've already implemented. Um, so this came at a large opportunity cost and ultimately um, we had to develop a whole portfolio of solutions. Jump to the next slide. So what does this actually look like? Well, in order to produce that much power, just using wind power alone, we had to cover roughly half the, half the land area of British Columbia um, with wind turbines. 
obviously we would have a whole portfolio solution. So it wouldn't just be that, that number, but that gives you kind of an idea of how much additional land we actually require just for, for the energy supply. Um, how much power is that? Well, it's roughly 3.16 uh, times what we had back in 2019. And that, that amount that we had there, 7,000 terawatts, had a cost of roughly $380 billion. Um, pass that on to Patrick to discuss some of the other implications. Yeah, thanks. Um, so really highlighting that uh, one of the biggest issues as, as we move forward to 2100, try and reach our climate goals with DAC is, is the prohibitive cost. Like Ryan said, uh, and like Harris said as well, there's a huge energy requirement for direct air capture and that feeds right into the cost. So what, what we're looking at is, is in, in 2020, kind of the range of negative emissions technologies that existed, uh, both looking at their price, but also looking at their scalability. So, so whereas uh, cost is one of the biggest downfalls for direct air capture, scalability, like Ryan was saying, is, is one of the biggest advantages. So the question really came down to, how can we scale direct air capture up uh, with its prohibitive cost, how can we drive the cost down? And uh, you know what sort of uh, things make direct air capture financially viable? So we were able to kind of, as we grew the industry for direct air capture, benefit from an economy of scale since we're, we're mass producing kind of the things we need to do direct air capture as well as growth in renewable energy sector that drove down the cost as well as just technological innovation and such. Uh, next. So yeah, as I was saying, you can see the trends on the right for both the price of direct air capture going down over the years. And uh, of course, carbon price coming up to meet the cost of, of direct air capture because uh, really as was as you saw in, in the Bex, Bex world as well, excuse me, um, <clears throat> you need aggressive policy because the, the economics of any net facility really, but DAC especially uh, come directly from policy. So for us scaling up uh, became easy after you hit this this kind of cost parity between marginal cost of, of a, a DAC facility and, and carbon price. But before that, scaling up is very hard. And that's where you need the kind of uh, outside investment from, from uh, big companies and, and outside sources. And uh, as well, uh, you're looking at the carbon price as a line, but really it's a spectrum over the entire world. So you know in 2020 that different views exist on, on carbon policy and the same is going to be true or the same is true in 2100, uh, it scales up at different rates in different places. And what that means for direct air capture as an industry really is that it will grows or it grew for us at, at different rates in those places. So uh, countries ended up kind of attracting uh, the growth of the industry or attracting the industry by uh, scaling up their, their carbon policy much quicker. Uh, next. And so kind of looking at an emissions climate perspective, if we, if we go back to 2020, uh, modeling work um, kind of suggested some, some possible scenarios. So if you look at, at the top uh, light blue line, that's a, a 1.5 degree C warming scenario where direct air capture was available. And whereas the dark blue lines are scenarios where direct air capture is not available. So, so their predictions, which were largely correct, uh, is that by having direct air capture available, you get kind of a, a delayed phase out of fossil fuels. Um, you can see that in, in the light blue line, all the way up until, until uh, beyond 2050, you still have positive emissions. And, and that's kind of what we saw in our world as, as we transitioned, is that we, we prolonged the use of fossil fuels uh, for energy and in, in other sectors, uh, because we had this faith that we could scale up direct air capture. The industry was growing and the technology was getting there. So, so we knew we could reach this massive amount of negative emissions required to eventually meet, meet our climate goal. But really that didn't come without a cost. Uh, next. So really there's, there's massive climate implications to, to delaying phase out of fossil fuels. Um, you know now in 2020, even that you're experiencing some of the, the negative effects of climate change in terms of forest fires uh, melting of permafrost, all of the dynamic systems that, that, that are a part of, of the climate. And really, uh, by not phasing out fossil fuels quickly, we're prolonging those effects and we're seeing those, those late stage effects. So 
the pathway that we locked ourselves into was really a risky one. And uh, I just want to make the point of saying that uh, don't view direct air capture as kind of a, a silver bullet that can save you from any, any possible path. And uh, you can both remove fossil fuels from, from plenty of sectors and scale up direct air capture. They're not, uh, they're not necessarily uh, dependent on one another. Uh, next. And then viewing it uh, as, as a transition from 2020 to 2100, there's of course many other issues that came along, such as growing both the renewable energy and, and the direct air capture industries. There's a shift in jobs from, from oil and gas to, the, to other sectors. There's some transferable skills, obviously, such as uh, CO2 injection, transport, and any kind of CCS will have this kind of crossover uh, uh, in terms of jobs. But really for direct air capture, and for the renewable energy that you require to go with it, uh, there's high skill jobs that that maybe the the requisite skills aren't, aren't uh, you know present in in every uh, every oil and gas uh, yeah <laughs> uh, sorry anyways um, air purity was was also a concern since we delayed the phase out of, of fossil fuels um, direct air capture is amazing for pulling down masses of ma massive amounts of CO2 and and mitigating climate change. But uh, of course, burning fossil fuels doesn't just emit CO2, it, it also emits other things. Um, so really air purity was an issue when we were delaying the phase out of fossil fuels. And then touch on briefly uh, the idea of, of equity globally. Um, often with, with resource consumption and, and our globalized world, um, in, in 2020, there's, you know, there's a dispute over, over different resources like oil, but, but largely, direct air capture is kind of absent from, from any kind of negative impact there. The, the air is abundant and um, so there's no reason to really cause any conflict over uh, use of it. And in terms of ecology as well, like, like Ryan mentioned, uh, you can put direct air capture anywhere and so you can avoid any kind of uh, disproportionately affecting wildlife or, or people in different places. Uh, next. So just to, to kind of quickly summarize advantages of, of the DAC world uh, uh, that we live in and uh, DAC in the future, um, really it's it's a way of achieving climate goals. It's it's scalable, so it can get you to the, to the climate warm uh, global warming targets that that you strive for. It has kind of the co-benefit of of developing a new industry, but potentially could also be seen as as a downside. In terms of having a large uh, initial costs as, as DAC scales up. There's also lots of areas where direct air capture kind of has little impact, which can be seen as a positive or a negative. So in terms of, of land use impacting hunger and uh, clean water availability, things like that, it has somewhat little effect when, when compared to other negative emissions technologies. But by far the biggest trade-off for for direct air capture is affordable and clean energy. I think uh, Ryan definitely drove that point home that it requires a ton of energy to operate these direct air capture plants and, and there's no way around it really. So um, I hope there's some, some takeaways for you in 2020 as you uh, move towards whatever climate future you're striving for. And I look forward to hearing your thoughts on, on our world and on Heather and Gerard's world as well. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Patrick. Um, great. So kind of moving into kind of our, our wrap up phase. Um, Harris, do you want to bring up, I guess, the word cloud next, right? Yes. Sorry, before we do that, we were going to do the poll first. So we have queued up a couple of questions um, and we're interested to see um, kind of your, the audience responses to these. So Harris is gonna launch a poll. It's a quick, just three questions. We'll give you kind of like 30 seconds to just click through. Um, some of them are multi-select one, a couple are just uh, pick an answer. So Harris, do you wanna launch those polls for us? Yes, of course. You can always take a minute and uh, click through. 
Yeah, we're thinking here of you now that you've heard some of the information we've been able to provide, kind of what your thoughts are. A few more seconds for that first one. Right. So views from, from the audience here, a um, little more favorable on DAC versus BEX, um, considerable number on other nets, and maybe we can explore that in the, the Q&A a bit more about what that might mean. Um, and then uh, a couple of people, uh, no nets, and the, the solar radiation management, which is another this is kind of directly controlling um, aerosols and things to try and actually uh, change change the insulation value. So it's interesting to see. Great, thanks. We're gonna fire up the next one there, Harris. So this is asking basically, what are you concerned about uh, when you think about nets? Another minute, a couple of 10, 20 seconds here. So energy consumption coming up in the ranking. Another five seconds here. If anyone wants to click any final answers, there we go. So yeah, so energy consumption being number one, um, obviously a yeah, big, big impact there. I guess it depends which net you're you're thinking about. The cost certainly. We talked a bit about kind of who's going to actually pay for this, um, and ecological impact um, up there as well. Less on the tech risk. So that's interesting. Uh, we think that it will work <laughs> generally. Um, okay, great. And then the final one, um, Harris. That was a really quick insight. Another five seconds here. All right, that's good. So an even, almost even split. We've we've changed a few people's minds. It's interesting. So it's good good to know that it, hopefully people have learned something then. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Harris. Um, so now yeah, let's flip over to our word cloud and see kind of what people were thinking about. Right. Yeah, so this is the net output of what everyone was um, inputting as we went through the uh, through the session there. Um, so it's interesting. The we we asked CCS as you've seen, there's a bunch of associated terms in this space. So carbon capture, storage, carbon utilization, uh, utilization and storage, and then net negative or negative emission technologies, etc. Um, so it's when you look at the the bigger words corresponding to to more that have um, reinforced that so necessary so so some agreements of um, needing it there the, the actual negative emission coming in expensive popping out I think that reflects some of the polling as well and, and again we've talked about uh, the costing on these things um, as as being a big big piece of it um, solution coming in there so again I guess speaking to uh, to positivity if I look at some of the the, the smaller bits, we've got some oil and gas pieces in there, some um, fossil fuel. Um, I guess wrapping this into the uh, some of the Q&A as well, and 
I wonder, Devin, if you wanted to comment a bit more on some of those around the the moral hazard piece and really what's meant by that. If we're if we're working with oil and gas, we have this just transition of those workers, but also, Eric, do you have any final comments on that moral hazard piece? Wow, uh, that's a can of worms. Um, I mean, uh, so so for the sake of the audience, uh, when we talk about moral hazard, what we mean is that. Uh, decision makers now are making decisions that have certain risks, but those risks or the, the bad stuff potential isn't being borne by the decision makers. And so that can come up when we're talking about uh, looking ahead, so intergenerationally, um, but it can also apply, uh, you know, just today to, to different groups or, you know, say uh, socioeconomic circumstances or geographic distribution. Um, yeah, it's it's a problem. So this is a this is a kind of where the big tension comes in negative emissions, where right now we have in our accounting systems a false equivalency between reductions and removals. And that that leads to this whole argument of, oh, you know, nets are delaying mitigation and, and decarbonization. And so there's there's you know, going from there, there's there's arguments why we should perhaps decouple these targets and pursue them in tandem. Uh, I could talk more about that, uh, but I think I'll stop there. Yeah, I think it's good. And, and I know a lot of us are modelers. So as Evan said, these these technologies get put into these big IMs and other things with certain costs and cost progressions and out pops an answer, um, which doesn't necessarily bring into it uh, some of these other um, knock on effects and things like that. Um, I hope other people on the team, if you're seeing words in there popping out at you, I see Elon Musk on there. Uh, that was interesting. The, there's a Carbon X Prize just announced um, this uh, week um, that, that he's helping finance. So that's maybe where that's coming from. Um, I don't know, others on the team, are there particular pieces in there you wanted to comment on? There's a, there seems to be minority skepticism because you see not a solution, impractical. Um, hard to abate. So there's ineffective. So they're using different words, but it does seem there's some people on either side of the argument. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. I'm just looking at some of the other um, question bits. Um, yeah, I was wondering on the development pathway um, we've, we've projected out to 2100 and what it might look like, um, but I wonder about thoughts from the team on some of those, like the carbonated beverage that uses CO2 to do that. Is it, is that tokenism? Does that help get awareness of the technology? Um, so a lot of the um, developers of DAC in particular are, are working with oil and gas companies. Does that, is that a legitimate track? Uh, technological development track and funding and what what that does. So interested if, if on the panel again, thoughts thoughts there. Maybe maybe looking at you virtually there, Devin. Oh dear. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's 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 challenging for these organizations being early stage and not having a robust ecosystem of potential off takers for the CO two. They they need the money. You know, regardless of, of who we're talking about to, to, to stay alive. So, you know, accepting, say, investment um, or projects from, from oil and gas, it, it, it's a judgment call on their part. Uh, certainly, so, so for example, Carbon Engineering, a local Squamish company is constructing a facility that will uh, feed into an EOR scheme. Uh, in contrast, uh, another direct air company called Climeworks, um, thus far at least, is, is avoiding any EOR uh, affiliated um, projects. Uh, yeah, it's. Yeah. <laughs> you do what you can, right? Short, right? I mean, yeah. you, you could argue Europe's a lot more supportive of early stage technology companies and they can get away with it there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we should mention in the Europe context, if you're wanting to follow up and look at a large scale project, there's one called Northern Lights, which is an integrated Norwegian offtake of point source and an offshore sequestration. It's an example of a fairly large rollout. Uh, Ryan, you got your hand up there. 
Yeah, I was just going to add to Devin's point that, you know, utilizing the CO2 and ultimately for EOR for synthetic fuels or whatever the purpose it is, um, you know, ultimately it's not a negative emission, but it is still working to scale up the industry. And so I think, you know, anything that provides a, a revenue source and a way to actually build that technology. I mean, if you look at this, the scale that it needs to get to, it's, you know, a million times what it is today or something on that order. So it's, yeah. it, it needs to get there somehow. And so it's, um, it's kind of a fine line to walk, I guess, you know, if you invest too much in that side, maybe you can't come back from it, but ultimately um, it needs to scale and it needs to scale fast. So. Yeah. You know, if we look at that plot that Devin had, the, the large bubbles on those projects were five megatons. We're talking, we need gigatons. So it's, it is already. Jared. Jared. Yeah, um, so, so first thing also on the um, world map, also the not a solution caught my eye, I have to say. Um, and I was, I was actually wondering um, that, that person, without putting that person on the spot, of course, but what that person thought about why is not a solution and what would be a solution then? Uh, so that, that's something uh, I was wondering. And about the CO2 beverage, um, that you were talking current. I think it's, it's what we mentioned in our talk uh, and what you also guys mentioned here, uh, that money is necessary at this stage of early development. And uh, um, even though it's not direct application of, of removing and storing CO2, um, we kind of need to de-risk the, the sector somehow. And to do that, we need to improve technologies uh, even though it's maybe an indirect food as, as a CO2 beverage industry. So I think in that sense, it's, it's good. It's not the ideal, but it's, it's certainly a way, I think. Yeah, great, thanks. So we've got, we've got two maybe final questions just to wrap this up. So uh, one is, is commenting on uh, low carbon fuel standard and how that might enable DAC. You know, again, Devin, have you got thoughts there? Um... Yes. Yeah, so in BC, low carbon fuel standard we have in California, we have low carbon fuel standard. I think a low carbon fuel standard is also part of the federal conservatives proposal to counter the liberals uh, tax. Um, it, the, the dollar values uh, can be quite high, you know, more than $100 per ton that depending on the jurisdiction can be applied in addition to say uh, 45Q if you're in the United States. Uh, the challenge with that is that there might not be that much credits of that dollar value at the higher dollar values. And so the issue is if you were to try and bankroll megaton scales of, of CO2, you, you may very well uh, bring that say 150 LCFS California uh, credit value down to something where it's no longer economic. Um, it's, it's hard to make a investment decision on a 40 year lifetime, let's say Bex plant based on uncertain um, uh, and politically tenuous credit schemes. Yeah. One thing to point out there though, the, uh, the Q45 one has some language that you can actually do projects outside of the US and have it count. So when we think about development of these markets, um, think about where do you actually physically have to be in that jurisdiction or is it actually a, a scheme that allows a cross? Um, so we're just about out of time. The, the final question there was just around, um, is there a middle ground between the two worlds? And, and probably like, I think like was emphasized in yesterday's um, ice fix session, there is no silver bullet. We maybe presented this as two diametrically opposed world. That's, that's highly unlikely to be the reality, of course. Um, so probably well, there's, there's efforts across this range of nets and, and things will play out, cost, technology progression, um, some of those unintended consequences, et cetera. Um, so for sure, there's, there'll be a, a mix there. I mean, the, I think the big thing right now is the cost of DAC is quite high. Um, there are claims of lower costs at maybe very small scales. People have tried things, but um, I think the, the scale up here is not to be discounted and that's, that's really the one of the main maybe right where we're engineers we can build things um, but is it cost effective and can it scale and fast enough there's 
um, comparisons made between like existing oil and gas infrastructure and then we need kind of the equivalent in terms of um, carbon reduction technology and you think about how long that takes and as associated what's the embodied energy of those things so um, yeah very lots of things to think about <laughs> okay so um, I want to respect everyone's time so officially um, we're, we're at the end of the session but as mentioned there's there's kind of a a hangout session afterwards, um, which we'll, so we can carry on and, and happy to keep discussing. I think the, the panel and sort of myself uh, can, can stick around for that. Um, but again, wanting to respect people's time. So thank you for attending. Thank you for participating. It's interesting to get that view of, of how people perceive this. That is uh, one of the tracks of the, the research project we're involved with is understanding that public perception part of it. Um, so, so some good insights for us there as well, and we'll, we'll share with the team. So appreciate that. Um, yeah. So I know Jacob. Uh, probably we can finish up on the recording, and then again, I'm happy to um, uh, take some questions here. If people want to turn on cameras and microphones, we can we can have a.